My name is Laura Schertz, and I'm an occupational therapist with TASC, the assistive technology program for our state. And for Valentine's Day, we wanted to share with you different assistive technology that we love. And one of the ATs that I like using is the PowerLink. I worked in the school system for many years and found that our students just really enjoyed using it, and it opened the door for doors for a lot of activities. So to start, I want to know a little bit about who you are and your experience with using a power link, which Laura Parks will get that for us. So you can, you can read the results. So we have a teacher, a therapist, and other. Oh, I can't read the results. Okay. So we have a teacher, a therapist, and other. Who's our other? Just out of curiosity. Just type in the question. Okay. <laughs> they want to just type in the question. Oh, perfect. Now I can see. So if our other person wants to just type it into question, what their role is. Oh, an AT specialist. Perfect. Oh, great. Great. Um, and what is everyone's experience with using a power link? You can select more than, than just one. Okay. okay, everyone's voted, so I will go ahead and show the results. So, as you can see, seems to be a pretty good spread. 67% of you have said you've used switches with toys, used switches with communication devices, used switches with computers, used switches with iPads, and used switches with power links. So we have a pretty good audience as far as knowledge, so some of this may be review, but hopefully you'll learn some new tricks with using the power link. Okay, great. Um, and sounds like you all have a lot of experience, so if you have anything to contribute during this and want to pipe in, please feel free. Um, via questions, yes. Now. Okay, so for the objectives, it's going to be kind of at the beginning level of assistive technology use. Uh, I want you to know how to learn and set up, uh, learn how to use and set up the power link. Uh, I def identify the different modes of use and the indications for each. And I'm going to briefly go over the first steps of a switch progression and kind of the hierarchy for where to start and then how to move forward with that. And then I'm going to conclude with some different ideas of activities for the kids or students or older children to, um, to do with the power link. So the power link, um, as I'm sure you know, since you all have used it before, is that it is any, a device where any electrical device can be plugged into it. And then the student or the user can act, operate that device with a switch. Uh, there are different modes. And what we'll do is we'll kind of go through, and I'll show you some good videos that will um, specifically go step by step of connecting some of the different appliances. So this first video is from AbleNet, which is where you can purchase a power link from. And it's just a quick one minute video that has the um, kind of the basics included in it. Hi, my name is Jason Boybich from AbleNet, and I'd like to introduce you to PowerLink 4. Now, for many of you who've had experience with previous versions of the PowerLink, I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised with the new model. The PowerLink 4 control unit allows switch users to control up to two electrical appliances independently with single switches. The new design has a simple and intuitive user interface, allowing easy setup and some powerful new features. 
Now, six unique modes of control allow you to define exactly how and for how long the appliances are turned on. The new count mode allows easy and precise data collection. The new two switch mode allows for collaborative action for safety or cooperative play. The onboard display allows you to set exactly how many minutes or seconds of control you need. Of course, the standard switch jacks are still included, but what's great about PowerLink 4 is that you can now control using AbleNet wireless switches. Now, for more information or detailed specifications on PowerLink 4, please visit ablenetinc.com. All right, so that is a very basic introduction. I thought I'd give you a close-up picture of what the PowerLink 4 looks like. Um, there are many older versions that still uh, work just as well, but these are the newer ones. What you have is um, the power switch on the back, and then here and here is where you can plug in different appliances. So anything that plugs into the wall can be plugged in. Um, then with the mode, the mode cycles between the six modes of control. The modes of control are either the direct, latch, or timed, or you can do the count to switch for the time minutes. This port and this port is where you would plug in the switch. So here's a little description that you may have of the mode and what the status buttons are used for, and then the plus and the minus is to set the length of time that you would want for the timed options. And I'm going to go into the modes of control um, pretty soon, but those are kind of the quick two-cent definitions that may be useful if you're describing that to someone who hasn't used a power link before. Here's the listing from AbleNet's website, which is www.ablenet.com inc.com and I thought it would be a good quick glance for the price so $230 and then you can also use the power link the newer power link with a wireless switch so the prices are there but it also works with um, a switch with the wire as well so you don't have to use a wireless one all right so we will um, Kind of the basics still, you can control up to two electrical appliances with a single switch through the various plugs. There are the six modes, and the power link accepts any type of switch, so it doesn't have to be from AbleNet. Or you can use the big beamer or the jelly beamer wireless switch with it. Um, they have improved the design. It's a lot more simple. And you can program for the specific length of time uh, that you, you might want the response for as well, which is a nice feature that goes along with it. Okay. And we will discuss the modes of control more in depth um, and when you would want to use each mode of control, but direct is when it behaves just like the traditional switch, so they access it and the device works. With the count, it's similar like the direct, but it shows the number of activations, so how many times that they have activated the switch. That might be helpful if you're wanting to track um, their use of it and maybe how many times out of, uh, with a certain number of, number of verbal cues to activate maybe the fan or the music and it's something good for tracking progress. The two switch, you can connect two switches for that and that's a little bit of a higher level skill. And then with the timed, you can set it with the arrows or the pluses and the minuses for how long you would want the reward to run. And then with the latch, when you hit the switch, it turns the appliance on and then when you hit it again, it turns it off. Okay, this video is from our AT friends in Missouri, and I selected this video to show you a good way of plugging it in and setting it up. This may also be a good video to share with parents um, if they have the power link on loan and would like to use it at home. Sometimes all the different cables and wirings can get confusing, so I thought that this was a pretty good, clear demonstration. He will show direct mode, timed mode, and a latch mode. And this video is about two minutes. Hi, 
Amy Baker with Missouri Assistive Technology here. Today we're going to talk about the PowerLink. The PowerLink is a simple to use environmental control unit made by AbleNet. The PowerLink is designed to be used with a switch and it provides individuals with physical disabilities the ability to actively participate in a number of fun activities and a variety of activities. To operate the PowerLink, you plug it into an electrical outlet. In this, and uh, then you can plug in virtually any electrical device. In this case, we'll use a lamp. And you plug in a switch. And it will work with virtually any switch. There are four control modes that users can choose from. Direct, timed seconds, timed minutes, and latch. Direct mode keeps an appliance on while the switch is activated. Timed seconds allows the appliance to be run from 1 to 60 seconds with a single switch activation. Timed minutes allows the appliance to be run from 1 to 60 minutes with a single switch activation. And latch allows via one activation the appliance to be turned on and with a second activation the appliance to be turned off. The power link has an unlimited number of opportunities to enhance a person's ability to control their environment and actively participate in things in the classroom, at home, and in even an employment situation. The power link as we said earlier, it's a simple to use environmental control unit made by the AbleNet company and it costs approximately $230. All right, so I think since he made that video, the price may have gone up a little bit since he said it's $230 and that was now listed um, for $2. For 300 I think it was. Um, oh, 230 Never mind. So the price has stayed the same. All right. So this is a fantastic resource, and we're going to be talking about the top part of it. This is from Inclusive Technologies, and you can access this from their website if you Google Switch Progression Roadmap. It'll come up, and it's a free download. It's a nice handbook that has a lot of different information on teaching students or other persons how to use a switch. What we're going to cover today will end right about here. So before going to um, the two switch use and we will kind of discuss not all of it will be with a power link but I will discuss strategies for using the power link in most of those instances. So at this experiential level, students are able to look and listen to animations without the student having to control them. So this is not using a switch. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be computer or software. It can be music or toys or different tactile materials. So a good goal, um, if you write IEPs or just a goal to keep in mind, at this level would be for students to encounter assistive technology generated activities and experiences. Um, they can show a simple reflex response like startling at the noise or may also on the other side experience it passively showing little interest or maybe some interest. So at the experiential level, our goal, what we ultimately want to do is provide the student with the range of experiences which will encourage them to look, listen, and then hopefully respond in a positive way. Um, a goal to think about for an IEP or otherwise, maybe that students show that emerging awareness of assistive technology generated activities. And that may be, um, the awareness may be by attending briefly to a sound or an on-screen movement pattern. Um, I know some Switch games has a little motorcycle driving across the screen and we might be able to observe the attention to the motorcycle moving across the screen. You can also see if they are showing some emerging awareness by 
noting if they have any intermittent responses to sounds or any type of response in addition to attending. So we need to identify what motivates the students. That's one of the most important things in um, working with all of our kids. So careful observation is what's really important. So for example, if you are using the equipment in a multisensory room, make a note of anything that has triggered a positive response. So we want to look at if they begin to respond consistently to activities, and that can be by briefly tracking those objects moving in a horizontal or vertical plane and showing consistent interest then and reacting and showing a consistent positive response to familiar images or sounds. The next thing that we want to see moving along in that progression before um, we really move to the next level of switch use is that they begin to be more proactive in their intentions in using assistive technology. So they may tolerate or participate in the shared exploration of the switch. They may reach out toward that switch or independently explore the switch, um, different tactile surfaces as well. So moving along the switch progression, from experiential learning, we go to the make something happen um, part of the map. And the, to progress from the experiential learning, our students need to develop an understanding of cause and effect. And by cause and effect, we simply mean that it helps the child understand that they're able to extend influence and control over their immediate environment and that an action on their part can cause a response either from other people or objects around them. This is the foundation stone for all future learning because um, how can a child understand their place in the world and in the school environment and the day if they don't know that they can actually have influence upon it. So the hard thing is is that cause and effect is not something that can be taught directly. Rather, the students have to develop their understanding through experiencing it through a range of different contexts. So this is difficult, um, but the more exposure that they can have with it and the more experience, then hopefully that understanding will continue to develop. Um, for example, you know, a baby throws the toy from the stroller or from the high chair and someone picks it up. And so there, they're having that cause and effect. Um, just like pressing a switch to make the jack-in-the-box pop open, that they're learning that they can do something to make something happen. Um, so the switch use is very powerful for our students uh, with motor, different motor abilities and because it gives them the way of a simple interaction as opposed to more advanced manipulation to create something to happen. But it's important to remember that for students with severe motor disabilities uh, or difficulties, that switches may be the only way that they can interact with their environment. And so we want to make sure that we can find a switch that they are able to use. Um, so when we are looking at different switches, we need to make sure that the student is positioned comfort, comfortably and is fully supported. Um, we don't want them to have to worry about trunk control or neck control and head control when they're also trying to think about the activation of the switch. Um, we need to consider if the target area of the switch is big enough for the student to touch. So they may, a small jelly bean switch may not be large enough for someone who has different movement patterns. We also want to consider visual, visual needs if the student can see the switch against the background, whether it's the background of the table or the coloring of their tray. And we really want to think about their strength, if they can apply enough pressure to the switch to activate it, or um, if they can sustain that pressure to keep it activated. And there are um, a wide range of switches available, so depending on what motor ability they have, we have many, many options to try to get something that may work. 
An accurate assessment will be required to identify reliable, consistent, and repeatable movement that the child will be able to make from their typical seating position. So we need to consider their medical issues, um, including the course of their possible medical issue and the prognosis of that, and maybe things like skin conditions, which could affect their movement and the positioning. We also want to look at their physical fun functioning, so which movements are voluntary and involuntary, their range of motion, how accurate is their range of motion, um, how quickly can the movement be made, and then how much pressure can be applied and how it can be sustained. We want to consider sensory impairments that may affect the use, so visual difficulties, a hearing impairment, some tactile sensitivities, and if there are any known perceptual problems to consider, like hand-eye coordination, tracking difficulties um, as well. So correctly identifying that reliable, repeatable, and consistent movement, and then selecting and positioning an appropriate switch to match that movement are critical factors uh, to consider for success in using a switch. Um, with all these levels, it's important to focus the student's attention on the activity that results from the switch rather than on the switch itself. I'm sure we've all been guilty of, I know myself included, when working with a student saying, press the switch. Um, what we want to do is have just remember the simple rule of telling them what the action is that will be resulting from the switch activation. So we want to always encourage them as well to look at the effect that they have created by the switch activation. An example is um, on a software game, Bob the Builder, and when you press the switch, Bob the Builder sings and dances. So instead of telling the student, press the switch, you would like to say, more Bob, please, or more music, something that is associated with the activity and with the resulting action. Then when the switch is successfully activated, you really want to praise and encourage that successful movement pattern, and, but encourage them to look and listen to the reward. So by saying, way to go, look at Bob singing, um, as opposed to good job pressing the switch. All right, so in the switch progression um, roadmap, under Make Something Happen, they have listed press and hold, press and let go, press it again, and turn on and off. And there are many different names for these types of modes. Even previously, I discussed direct and latch. And so in the next couple of slides, I will make sure to link the names for you. All right. so. Press and hold, also known as direct, this is where the learner or the student is required to press the switch and hold it down in order to trigger an effect. The best example of this is with switch adapted toys. So the student presses the switch and then while the switch is held down, the toy continues to move. Uh, once the child stops pressing the switch, the effect will end. Um, it's one of the best ways to experience cause and effect and one of the best ways to learn cause and effect since it, the effect only happens when the student's hand is pressing the switch, which further reinforces that the student is making that effect happen. So a good goal maybe for an IEP or to keep in mind would be that they use the switch to produce a desired effect. And you can tie that desired effect into standards or um, other curriculum-based activities. And this can be with physical prompting or with hand over hand or just maybe some physical cues as well. With direct, you can also incorporate electrical appliances with a power link on a direct setting, which I will show you an example of um, using direct access to make milkshakes. They were called sunshine sh shakes in this upcoming video. And it is a video demonstrating the use of a wireless jelly beamer.
and they were also using several AAC communication devices like a step-by-step -step and a um, <clears throat> level communicator, um, and that's what you couldn't hear necessarily. So they were combining it with the power link, which is a great thing to do if you have a child with enough physical movement in order to activate a power link and a communication device at the same time. Okay, and our next video is um, quite an interesting setup. It can be an inspiration for y'all looking at for different activities, maybe in the science area. But this is a setup of um, using a string switch to activate um, an electric drill which weeds the garden. So I had a hard time telling if this was a timed activation or a direct activation. Um, I couldn't really see if the guy was still pulling on the string while it was going. So um, it's a good example of how you could use both. You could set the timer for it to run for the length of time to pull the weed or just do direct where you continuously activate. It. Not what I was expecting, Laura, when you said the word drill. They kind of modified it slightly by putting a string on the drill bit. <laughs> I thought it was creative. <laughs> All right. Okay. So most of us are familiar with the press and let go skill. And this is where the student presses the switch to start an activity, which will play for a set period of time, irrespective of whether or not they have released the switch. So when working at this level, we need to encourage the student to press the switch and then release it. Um, so we don't want their hands just resting on it or continually pressing it, um, as it is different than the direct access. It can be a little more difficult for the student to understand the effect as it is not obviously linked to the switch press as in the press and hold or direct. So you can choose the time function and the number of seconds or minutes that you would like to for the reward to last. And control units can be used with a wide range of appliances such as blenders. Um, and that was the example of where I wasn't sure if it was a time as an impress and let go or if that was a direct from the video before. The um, control units can be used to switch adapt most electrical equipment to provide a greater depth of experience. So you can connect a desk fan which will blow a breeze into the student when the switch is pressed and um, that would be maybe a good example for a press and let go as they can press it and then they can feel it and then if it starts to annoy them they can press it again um, to make it stop which is latch which we will talk about or in this instance once the reward ends they can press it for it to go again. Um, in this video, you will see um, Nicole, they said her name was, using a power link with a wireless switch to turn on her lights in her room. Uh, this is an example of the press and let go because she's able to activate it and then they stay on for a certain length of time. And then she would have to press it again for, um, for it to turn back on. Uh oh, our tree lights came off. Oh dear. Yay, good job. That is awesome. Yeah, there they are. They're on. Yay, Nicole. Good job. Thanks, Ed.
get him for our kill switch. <laughs> I thought that was a sweet example of how um, this can be used at home in addition to um, in different school environments. Okay, so although this mode isn't applicable for most control units, um, press it again is often called switch building, where um, there is an activity where the student is required to press the switch a number of times to receive the reward. So this may be by pressing the switch to build pictures, or scenes, or press the switch to keep an activity playing, which is more similar to the timed mode. In these activities, the learner is prompted to press the switch again when the activity stops. And um, sometimes these software programs will have an on-screen switch prompt of a picture of it when they need to press it again. Um, some sample goals are listed there for you. Of they can activate a switch a number of times to keep an activity playing or um, activate the switch a number of times to complete a sequence and then noticing when it is time to activate the switch again for it to continue. Alright, so for turning on and off, this is also called latch and it is at the cause and effect level of making something happen. Um, it's a pretty simple process and the student pushes the switch to start the activity and then presses it again to stop. Um, a good goal for this in an IEP would be that they use the switch to complete simple tasks and sequences and you can connect that with any type of standards based um, activity that you want to do with them. So the latch is really good for using switch toys and for electrical appliances with a power link. And the next video I'm going to show you is actually in Spanish, uh, but I thought it was a good example. You can see in the bottom right corner of the image that that is an older power link um, and it still works very well. And it was if you watch, it's the latch because he turns it on and it keeps blowing and then she's telling him that it's loud, we'll turn it off. And so he clearly understands that cause and effect of I need to turn it on to make it happen and I need to turn it off to make it stop. Uh, I have to admit I never thought about using a leaf blower, but I love how that child was able to bowl with a simple switch activated switch. How awesome. I thought that was cute and fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so the next video, I forgot to mention at the beginning of this that it is um, I have it pretty heavily loaded with videos. I think it's fun to see some different examples. This is quite an intricate setup with a Big Mac and then a wireless Jelly Beamer and our bubble machine and fan. So the red Big Mac is connected to the bubble machine to make the bubble machine work. And then the yellow Jelly Beamer is connected to the fan to work wirelessly. The fan is plugged into the power link and the red Big Beamer controls the light, which you can't see yet. Um, the light is plugged into the power link as well. So see if we can follow um, all the different connections in this video. And one note too, it doesn't have to be that complicated. You could have just plugged in the fan to get the same effect.
Okay. I thought the music was fun with that as well. So um, next I wanted to share this with you, and this is a um, publication that's available online. And this is um, an interview, kind of a question and answer with a woman who's a special ed teacher in elementary school, and she's been working in the past 13 years in Texas. Um, she primarily works with students with severe and multiple developmental cognitive disabilities, and the article is about how she loves the creative challenges and opportunities that um, have presented themselves. So the first example she was just talking about so literacy activities. So starting in this one with reading Three Little Pigs and then building houses with the students and then incorporating a power link and um, a hair dryer to make the houses be blown down, which is a lot of fun for the children to then act out the, the different stories. In her next example, she was discussing and went into a very elaborate description of how they created a restaurant and they had some of the sixth grader typical peers come in and part of the students' activities were to make orange juice with the blender. Um, for some of the other cooking activities, she connected a um, can opener, an electric can opener, to the power link so the students could open the cans. They could, she attached a mixing bowl or a mixer to the power link so she could have the students help mix ingredients as well as um, blending. So basically anything that works electrically, you are able to kind of plug it in and, and run with it. This is another publication online, and um, I thought there were some other really good ideas of how you might be able to use this with some of your students or at home. Um, I love, when I worked in the school system, having jobs for my students to do, and a great one using a power link would be connecting a shredder to it. So plug in the shredder into the power link, and then they can activate the switch when it's ready for the paper to go through the shredder. You can also have kids and help them find a more meaningful way to participate in birthday celebrations. And some different ideas were helping to make the birthday cake with different cooking appliances. If at the party, different games with music, the child can control the music by starting and stopping it. Um, and another idea, which I thought was great, and you have to be a little careful about it, would be connecting the fan to the power link and then having the student access the switch to use the fan to blow out the candles. Um, then some good ideas for at home were connecting um, a power link to either the radio or the lights or the fan and giving that child or student some independence for control of their environment. Uh, helping prepare foods, dinners, or snacks. And I thought a fun one was Christmas tree lights, especially around the holidays, letting the child turn them on and off for the family. So that concludes um, all of the information that I have right now on the power link. And um, I hope that you found some of this information helpful. I think Laura Parks has some wrap-up questions for you that we can cover. Um, yeah, we'll go ahead and at the end of this webinar. You'll be receive a survey. Um, as long as you complete the survey, answer the questions, we will send you an email certificate of completion for this. Um, or if you have any other questions, you can feel free to chat, type them in the chat. And we will also go ahead and stop the recording now. And if you have a specific question and you'd like to ask it over the microphone, we'll be happy to 